So next up we have uh, Tony Moss. Um, and uh, the title of, of Tony's piece is Music and the Psychedelic Experience, a Queer View on its Evolution and Pivotal Role in Shamanic, Psychedelic, and Therapeutic Practice. So Tony is a visual and recording artist, music and event producer, public speaker, and founder of I Am Life, an LA-based nonprofit event production company focused on interconnectivity. Um, Moss's work focuses on the spirit, um, experience and science of interconnectivity, which he believes is fundamental to a sustained path forward for humanity. He produces projects and events that bring together modern and indigenous wisdom and knowledge with an emphasis on the evolution of human consciousness, fostering greater understanding and a reverence for nature. With over 20 years experience in the study of the psycho-spiritual use of ayahuasca and traditional and neo-shamanic technologies of healing and transformation, he is a public advocate for the legalization and responsible use of all plant medicines. Yes, brother. Uh, Moss has spoken at numerous conferences in the US and abroad, has been a featured guest on the Discovery Channel's uh, Expedition Unknown, several podcasts, including Zach Leary's It's All Happening, and is featured in several upcoming documentaries, including The Song That Calls You Home, premiering at the 2019 World Ayahuasca Conference in Spain, which just happened, yeah? Yep. Yeah, great, congratulations. Um, his music is distributed internationally and will be featured in a variety of upcoming documentaries and media projects. In Tony's words, life is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> He's uh, joined today by his assistant, Shireen. So lovely to have you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Normally, I just kind of like go in a stream of consciousness and rattle off all kinds of tales, but this is a new talk, and so I'm going to kind of challenge myself to follow the script a little bit, so <laughs> we'll see what happens. We traveled far to find this place Well, we resource find a warm and And uh, we particularly love music, we do, in uh, its ceremonial and psychedelic therapy context. You know, it was in ritual and ancestors with the company of music 
that our ancestors would come together and share their cosmology and their values. You know, it's where they would pass on the values and cosmologies of the, the tradition and the community, actually. And where they would, as you know, mark the seasons, um, celebrate the harvest, um, create and acknowledge rites of passage, you know, collectively grieve, sometimes heal each other, connect with their gods, and then occasionally prepare for battle. You know, it, it was an integral part of tribal life, in a lot of ways still is, and it's very much hardwired into our DNA. And more often than not, when we gather together in ceremony, there would be music. So I'm going to teach you a quick little song here. Everyone, first just repeat the lyrics after me. Ancestors, rise up beside me. And give me strength and love to receive this day. So with the melee, ancestors rise up beside me. Give me strength and love to receive this day. Your turn. Ancestors rise up beside me. Give me strength and love to receive this day. Close enough. <laughs> I hear the Milky Way Another star was born today While waters arise And forests fade I'm singing Ancestors rise up beside me, give me strength and love to receive this day. Again, I'm singing, ancestors rise up beside me, give me strength and love to receive this day. Oh, we love the drum. Studies conducted by professionals in the field of music therapy and music psychedelic therapy you know, have shown that drumming reduces tension, anxiety, and stress, helps control chronic pain, it boosts the immune system, and releases negative feelings and blockages and emotional trauma. And rhythmic drumming induces altered states. The brain changes from beta waves to alpha waves, producing feelings of euphoria and well-being. And that alpha activity is associated with meditation, shamanic trance, and integrative modes of consciousness. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we evolved with music. Um, it was instrumental in our evolution as a way of sharing emotions and forging powerful social bonds, which was necessary for survival. It still is. Oxytocin, the bonding hormone that releases when we interact with our loved ones. Everybody just interact with the loved one. <laughs> Oxytocin is powerfully released also when we sing and we drum together. Right? So everyone just do this. You already know the lyrics, and we're gonna sing. Ancestors rise up beside me, give me strength and love to receive this day. We're singing, ancestors rise up, give me strength and love to receive this day. There, you're all flooded with oxytocin, you're bonded as a tribe now which means we will survive. <laughs> and you're also experiencing something that music also does in ceremony, which is the experience of entrainment, right? That we all move into a kind of very similar wavelength and um, that's the best way to explain it in this context, yeah? That we become entrained with the music and the rhythm, right? That ancestor song, the one we just taught you, when we share that in ceremony, it's in a section that we call the ancestral healing part of ceremony. And the interesting thing is, you know, when that song is shared, most people report that they actually have visitations of ancestors, right? And you would say, well, of course, because we just suggested it, right? So that's not the phenomenal part, because under the influence of ayahuasca, you're in a highly suggestive state. What is amazing is what comes after that. 
you know, is that typically, yeah, well, first of all, there's this research as a lot of you have heard of that the traumas and trials, challenges of our ancestors is deeply encoded into our DNA, and we all walk with it, right? And in ceremony, during this ancestral section, people will often share that that's exactly what comes up. They start to have deeply profound insights into you know, their behavior, you know, um, ideas about their identity. Um, and oftentimes, that can lead to the very deep and root foundational causes of things like anxiety and depression, right? And in that space, the heart opens and those experiences start to come to the surface. And because the music is there and guiding you along, it creates this very safe place to start to actually unfold and confront those things. So it's, it's very, very powerful, right? The ancestral healing is key to almost all psychedelic therapy and ceremonial work in general, I found over the years. You know? Sometimes it sheds really profound insights you know, into our, not only behavioral patterns, but our entire worldview. Right? You start to see that you're walking around the planet thinking that you're this authentic person having authentic thoughts and experiences and interacting with the planet. In reality, you start to realize like, oh, actually this is all cultural conditioning. One of the things that comes up a lot in this uh, conference is this idea of white privilege. Okay? And a lot of people are like, well, you know, I'm not a racist. I, I dated a black person. <laughs> and the people that know better are kind of rolling their eyes, you know. But in the ways that we are all racist, you know, we can't see because it's a foundational part of our conditioning. It takes something to kind of like hold a mirror up and look back and go, oh, I'm actually, the world was created for privileged white men, you know, and women lately to move in, right? So when you start to see how you are a white privileged person, and I can tell you being a, an educated and fairly well off black person, I'm moving around with white privilege too, right? I have a sense of entitlement for sure, you know, that I can travel the world and do this work and speak at these conferences, you know, um, which is the kind of evolution of, to me, the white privilege thing, right? Which is basically just that I think now white privilege is almost equated to consumerism, capitalism, slash democracy, right? Which has been exported all over the world. So as an American person, regardless of your color, to some degree, you're kind of moving through the world with on this magic carpet of white privilege. <laughs> right. So songs like these right, um, that we just shared are in the category of what we call contemporary medicine music. It's really the evolution of traditionally shared music and plant medicine ceremonies. But like everything else, you know, ceremony music and ceremony itself evolves. Contemporary psychedelic therapy, in a lot of ways, is actually just the evolution of ceremony. And I use the term music in this talk very broadly to include all songs, chants, and sounds intentionally shared in the ceremony. In a traditional Shipibo ayahuasca ceremony, which most of you are familiar with, you would generally only hear um, ikaros, which are the healing chants that are sung by the curanderos, um, the healers. These have evolved into the mestizo songs that most people that attend ayahuasca ceremonies today are familiar with. Ayahuasca curandera caia puntae mantae mari. Ayahuasca curandera caia puntae mantae mari. Ay mariri, mariri, mariri. Ay mariri, Clancy was sharing yesterday one of the beautiful hymns from the Salto Daimi tradition which is, uh, many of you know, is a ayahuasca church, but Judeo-Christian that comes from Brazil. And the traditional hymns you know, that are sung in Christian and Catholic ceremonies get replaced in the Santo Daime by these beautiful hymns that they say are received from the medicine itself. So again, we're just looking at an evolution of a religious ceremony with the advent or the inclusion of, in this case, ayahuasca, you know, a plant medicine. 
And the songs are serving the same purpose, but they start to shift. If not, go a little bit deeper because you're allowed to. <laughs> we'll just leave that there. Um, in this era now of what's called neo-shamanic, neo-shamanic practices, neo-shamanic ceremonies in the West, the music shared is a wide variety uh, of traditional and was generally referred to now as contemporary medicine music, which is our area of focus. But the question is, why music and ceremony at all? Well, music plays several very important roles in the plant medicine and psychedelic therapy experience. Initially, it creates a harmonious environment for people to relax into and feel safe. It releases stress, you know, and it paves the way for the more dynamic and specific traditional uses of music that can facilitate the deeper healing process. Slow, Ambient music tends to calm our physiology down, and the fast music tends to speed it up. I think most significantly is that music and ceremony arouses our emotions. In ceremony, as a lot of you know, the music can make us feel really, really good or can make us feel really, really bad. <laughs> uh, it can be calming and comforting, viscerally emotional, or it can be abrasive and confronting. It, it can make us laugh, you know, cry tears of sadness and joy, evoke melancholy and yearning, can often open up our empathy, and can also be really annoying and take us to like those deep, dark, unavoided places that make us lose our shit, literally. <laughs> <laughs> or it can make us, you know, ecstatic with reverence and bliss. And sometimes it's so beautiful and moving that we literally don't think we can contain ourselves, you know. And I've had that experience many times where you're just like, <laughs> I just can't. <laughs> right? Yeah. So whether the music is resonant or dissonant, right, it doesn't matter. It still has a very profound effect on our psyche and our emotion. And it goes even deeper than that, you know, because for many indigenous people, plant medicine, in conjunction with music and sound, is acknowledged and used as an actual technology for healing. Right? The foundation of that technology, you know, at its core, is basically this, that frequency and vibration are used as carriers of intention. The body, the mind, the cosmos responds to frequency and vibration. If you're in the world of quantum physics, Eastern mysticism, and Buddhism, you're dealing with frequency and vibration. Prayers, mantras, chants are intentions utilizing frequency and vibration. And I was working and studying with the Shipibo some years ago. The Kudendero I was working with said to me one night at the ceremony, he said, you know, we acknowledge that ayahuasca is the true healer. That's the true shaman. But it's the ikaros, the language and the intention, that tell it where to go. Ayahuasca, Kudendera, Medicina, Kuda Kuda, Pachamama, Abundita, Medicina, Kuda Kuda.
the indigenous groups that we've studied with over the years that work with plant medicines in a ceremonial context have a very, very sophisticated understanding of the role of music in ceremony as an actual technology. Right? Mixed with sound and language and intention, right? as a healing modality, that the Western modern world is in reality really only just starting to fully grasp. You know? Research from the Berkeley Imperial Psychedelic Research Program found that LSD increases the flow of information between visual and mentory, uh, mental centers, I'm sorry, visual and memory centers in the brain. And as it turns out, music pretty much does the same thing. Uh, Alex, the first video? I should just say video one. I think a lot of you have seen this one. It went viral a few years ago. Oh, Shireen's got it. I'm like looking for Alex. Alex! Alex. Okay. Another video clip, and uh, this is about Alzheimer's, and it's from a, a new documentary that's called Alive Inside. So let's watch it, and then we can talk about this. Henry is one of the five million people in America with dementia. Hi, Papa. We first see Henry inert, maybe depressed, unresponsive, and almost unalive. Henry. Yeah. Henry. Yes, yeah, so. I found your music. Then he is given an iPod containing, we know, his favorite music. And immediately he, he lights up, his face assumes expression, his eyes open wide, and he's being animated by the music. And he used to always sit on the unit with his head like this. He didn't really talk to much people. And then when I introduce the music to him, this is his, his reaction every since. <laughs> A philosopher Kant once called music the quickening art. And Henry is being quickened. He's being brought to life. Thank you. I'm going to give it back to you. Uh -huh. OK. The effect of this doesn't stop, because when the, uh, the headphones are taken off, uh, Henry, normally mute and virtually unable to answer the simplest yes or no questions. Yeah, I'm crazy about music. You play beautiful music, beautiful sound. Did beautiful. You, did you play music when you were, uh, were you, did you like music when you were young? Yes, yes, I went to big dances and things. What was your favorite music when you were young? Well, uh, I guess, uh, well, Cab Calloway was my number one band guy I like. That is the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy. What's your fav favorite Cab Calloway song? Oh, I'm the old of a Christmas. Oh, you can complain only with plenty of snow, mistletoe, present, reverend, new tree, ow. So in some sense, Henry is restored to himself. He has uh, uh, remembered uh, who he is, 
and uh, he's he's reacquired his his identity for a while through the power of music. Wow. Pretty amazing, right? So as you can see, music has a very unique and powerful effect on our brains, especially in response to music that we actually resonate with. You know, we all have memories, pleasant and unpleasant, buried in our subconscious and in the body, so to speak, that are forgotten, locked away, buried, or suppressed, sometimes intentionally. And it turns out that music and memory are linked, and this is key, right? In ceremony and, therap and psychedelic therapy, music, the right music at the right time, can trigger memories and bring on a swell of emotion that unlocks and gives us access to key fundamental aspects of our psyche, revealing blocks that are often foundational, like root causes of our dis-ease. The heart can be blown open and flooded with grief and joy and love, and sometimes it helps release long-held anger, frustration, and fears. You know, for me growing up, music was just a part of everyday life. Um, my mother and her singers were known as, uh, her sisters were known as the Stovall Singers, um, who were also one of the sets of the Ikeettes with Ike and Tina Turner. Yeah, <laughs> so music was just every place. Everybody in my family could sing and sing really well, right? Um, so I got exposed to all kinds of music, but what was foundational was gospel music. Uh, we were a Southern Baptist family. The church was front and center. This is on my mother's side. But on my father's side, they were Catholic, right? Right here in San Francisco, actually. So I grew up in Oakland and here. And it would, it would not be unusual on a Sunday for me to start the day with, you know, hallelujah and gospel and people shouting and in the aisles and having a good time, you know, and praise of the Lord with Baptist music. And then we travel across the bridge to San Francisco and be in the Catholic service. And I'd be on my knees, you know, singing in Latin, <laughs> um, which as a kid was really boring, but the music still had a really beautiful and profound effect on me. You know, um, so although at a very young age, a very young age, I was able to realize that music had a profound effect on how it can make us feel. It had never occurred to me that music could actually be used to facilitate other people's healings. Right. So about 27 years ago, I did my or experienced my first LSD experience, and that same year, a friend invited me to an ayahuasca ceremony. And those two experiences would change not only my relationship with music, but really the course of the rest of my life. You know, they gave me a whole new understanding and appreciation for music. And all the music of my early years would come flooding back with you know, new insights and understandings about those different parts of my life. And um, so my relationship with music was not only kind of re-enchanted, but um, I kind of fell in love with it all over again. Right? And, and it goes even deeper than that, because, you know, when we talk about music, we can't not talk about movement, which is another key piece of the importance of music in therapy and ceremony. John has Parkinson's. It's an insidious disease that attacks the parts of the brain that allow movement. In my case, I have this shovel where I start to I just have to walk too fast, and I can't sort of stop myself. And uh, so I have to be very careful. Well, not do, do a face plant, really. Here at the Human Movement Lab, Professor Meg Morris has spent years analysing these movement problems and trying to find a way to help. For reasons unknown, there's a lack of dopamine in the brain, and dopamine normally allows movements to be performed large or fast, and balance is affected as well. So what John has, you can see here, is a freezing of gait, and the feet are sticking to the floor. But watch what happens when we start the music. It's very beautiful to watch. It is, it's so beautiful. And for a person who is shuffling and blocking and freezing, to be moving like that. So what we think music does is to bypass the defective basal ganglia to activate what's trapped inside. So the music provides an external rhythm to compensate for the defective rhythm inside the brain. Profound. <laughs> 
Yes. So as it turns out, unlike other stimulus, music gets embodied in multiple parts of the brain. Right? And as we know, neurons that fire together wire together. So it's music and memory and emotion that are intricately linked. Right? And that's a profound understanding for people that are doing psychedelic therapy or ceremony work. You know, the human brain can process information from num in numerous ways, and our brains can forge new pathways and make new connections, which we all know now is referred to as neuroplasticity. And thank goodness for that, right? So in short, music wakes up the brain, right? And appropriate use of psychedelic or plant medicines uh, with music increases our receptivity to it, right, and vice versa. So used in synergy, they create a powerful state of neurogenesis, you know, allowing us to rewire ourselves and hit the reset button, um, which becomes an extremely potent tool for psychedelic therapy and shamanic healing work. Right? So in closing here, that last video is an excerpt from a documentary called The Music Memory Project. It's a relatively new form of treatment for people with Alzheimer's, dementia, and Parkinson's that simply utilizes personal prescribed music playlists. And it's had, as you can see, a startling effect on some of the patients. It helps them to access memory and identity, reconnect with loved ones, and for some, for a period of time, as you saw, it completely brings them back to life, right? Since for most of us, music is associated with different phases of our life and is embedded, again, in so many parts of the brain, even memories that we've lost access to for whatever reason can be stimulated and recalled, and even people with complete memory loss due to like brain injury uh, and disease, often those lost memories and parts of their lives can suddenly be kind of reborn and they're very lucidly living them again. And for that period of time, they become very lucid, right? Because again, unlike other stimulus, which is important, the most important part of this is that music can arouse most parts of the brain, right? So back to my personal story for a minute. That's what I want to close with. As far back as I could remember, I had attractions uh, to boys. And that wasn't really problematic for me, because I also had attractions to girls, right? But the girl attractions weren't problematic. Right? In my family, I quickly learned, like most of us do, it's like you know, Southern Baptist, black family living in Oakland in the hood. My attractions to boys were definitely going to be problematic. Right? Um, I learned, like most of us, to oppress that, you know, and deal with the, the, the pain of the teasing and the oppression and all that, that came along with that experience. And so, like a lot of young boys my age, I turned to the Bible. I thought, I'm going to pray and handle this thing, you know, this phase that I'm going through. And for a period of time, it really worked. But then I met Neil. <laughs> I met Neil. Neil. <laughs> Neil and I met in grammar school. He, <laughs> Neil had blonde hair and bright green eyes and tan skin. We quickly became friends. And one day, we were walking home from school. And I was telling some bullshit story about my grandmother. And somewhere in there, he said, oh, she probably thought you were really cute. And so do I. And I was like, to which I replied, nothing. <laughs> And I just started talking really rapidly and fast because that's what I do when I get nervous. <laughs> um, I could not deal with what was coming up. Everything that I thought I had successfully oppressed and gotten rid of came flooding back, you know? And I was kind of really unable to process that moment. So fast forward 20 years later and a lot of relationships, I'm in an all-male ceremony with the Santo Daime out in the desert. And this famous story, the very condensed version, my father, who had died five years earlier, appeared to me. The music's playing shh, shh, with the madaka. We walk off. I can still hear the music. And I had this vision of these Africans running through the fields and being chased by you know, Europeans and maybe some other Africans getting on the ships, coming to America, sold into slavery. And my father and his father and my mother's father appeared to me and said, we brought you here because we wanted to apologize for all the pain and suffering that we caused you. Right? And we want you to understand that the reason we inflicted that pain and suffering on you is because that's what our fathers inflicted on us, and that's what their fathers inflicted on them and them, and it went back and back. And in that moment, my life suddenly made sense. I had complete and total forgiveness. I understood, 
ill, what we're now kind of referring to as um, post-traumatic slave syndrome. And as I forgave my grandfather and the other grandfather, they dissipated. But my father stayed and he said, and by the way, I want you to know, my parting gift to you is, all your partners, you haven't been in relationship with them, you've been in relationship with me. And I was like, again. <laughs> Holy shit, <laughs> quite literally. Ayahuasca in concert with, and that's a pun intended, in concert with music, like a lot of other people, gave me my life back. You know? And I don't currently identify with being gay, bisexual, or straight. You know, gender and sexuality, as we all know, especially you all, that it's fluid, right? And like everything else, it's always evolving, it's diverse, multifaceted, and it's this beautiful expression of life. You know, and I'll leave you with this, which is what happened in that moment. The father vanished, and the spirit of ayahuasca, God, the cosmos, however you cognize that, this voice came through loud and clear, and it shared with me this. It said, it's actually on this page. Oh, that's interesting. Oh. It's not even there. This is great. So I get to say what it said. <laughs> it basically said, I don't give a damn about your sexual, gender, or cultural identity. It said, who you are is the cosmos itself, unfolding as itself. It says, you are a beautiful, divine expression of all that it is. Right? And like everything else, it's like you are constantly in diversity, unfolding, and blooming and wanting to connect with and share intimacy with all other forms of being. Like, there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. And pretty much it said, and with that, go forth and multiply. <laughs> you know, and where that kind of understanding the medicine can understandably be threatening and confrontational to a lot of people whose consciousness is embedded in and limited by various belief systems, in actuality, it's liberating. And the truth of it is that it will set us all free. May the grace of God always be with you, shining from within, and bring new joy to every soul. That is a lie. And may all the beings in all the worlds be happy. And may all the beings in all the worlds be free. May all the beings in all the worlds be happy. May all the beings in all the worlds be free. I could a I I could I go I I made a sing die I owe a sky I made a sing die Could I go I I owe a sky I could I go I Thank you That was fun, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's fun to present something new and uh, it's a, a subject that's obviously near and dear to my heart. You know, and each of those subjects, you know, neurobiology, the, we didn't even, the epigenetics, right? all the levels of music and what it's doing in concert with uh, medicine is so profound. Each one would deserve a talk in and of itself, but we had to whittle it down somehow. So any questions or commentaries? Um, my name is Reaver. Uh, nice to meet you. And 
uh, just first off, thank you for talking about Parkinson's and Alzheimer's um, mm -hmm. specifically. They're, they're very near and dear uh, to my heart and my family history. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, I just kind of wanted to ask a general question. Um, where kind of the best jumping point f for learning a lot more about um, both the relationship for music and uh, uh, like dementia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and music and psychedelics in general were a great place to start as far as like a knowledge base mm -hmm. uh, would go because it's something that I'm extremely interested in, um, like psilocybin, re Parkinson's uh, research and whatnot. And I have known for a while that I wanted music to be a very big part of the research that I would eventually do because um, it's been such a massive part of my healing and ability to work through my own trauma. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. I, I would just love some, some pointers about like the best places and like, I guess, wells of knowledge are for this to start. I would th that's a great question, thank you. There's, if you just Google music therapy, it, it's unfolding so rapidly and exponentially what we're starting to understand. Um, and as you saw, like the profound effects it had on those two uh, uh, men in the video, um, that's opening up a whole new area of study in neurobiology, right? And even in the realm of epigenetics, you know, um, really briefly, you know, there's this idea that we used to think that we were kind of slaves to our genes. Now we know that's not true. Even though you might have the same gene expression as your parents, again, and going back to our ancestors, it, what turns them on or off is what's important. And what Bruce Lipton says is that it's emotions, right? So. Even this area of music, what it's doing in ceremony and its ability to affect our genes is really profound. But I would probably start by going to the Beckley Foundation site. They have a lot of beautiful articles on this subject. And also um, the Music and Memory Project, which is what the second video was from. If you go to that site, there's uh, amazing information on what they're probably expanded since then and what they're starting to understand. Because obviously, for that period of time, both those people were very lucid and could speak. The question now is how can we use music to kind of elongate that space, right? So that instead of just that moment where he's suddenly dancing, it's like, can we have music somehow playing all the time and this guy can actually dance and speak and move? We don't know, but it's brand new and it's really exciting. Yeah. Anyone else? Often in ceremony, I'll go, okay, chickens. <laughs> Hello, I'm Will, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you think everyone has rhythm? <laughs> Speaking solely from a person of color from Oakland, no. <laughs> And the more uh, scientifically minded academic person that I am, which by the way, I'm not an academic, I'm definitely self-taught, um, because of music actually. When I was in school, uh, I was gonna enter college and study theater and uh, I kept getting jobs, like in theater and things, and I needing to drop out of school. And at some point my friends are like, dude, you're already doing what you're gonna do with your degree, just do it. But I also love learning, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna drop out of school, but just self-educate myself. That was such a great decision because that became a lifelong um, habit. Uh, anytime I was interested in something, I would just study it, you know? So a, a more honest answer is uh, a lot of it has to do with entrainment, you know? If you're younger, you know, it, as a lot of you know, it is, although it does happen, it's rare for me to meet black people that can't carry a rhythm or you know, dance to one. And in fact, when other black people, here's the funny thing, black people see white people not dancing going like, I don't know what they're dancing to. It's not this song. <laughs> but they're getting down, they're expressing themselves. But when you see a black person not dancing, you're like, oh, no, 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 no. Something is definitely wrong. <laughs> well, it turns out, no, not everybody does have an, uh, an innate sense of rhythm. However, if you grow up with it, you're hearing it in the womb, and obviously in my case, you're hearing it all the time. Um, absolutely, everybody relatively, yes, does have rhythm. Yeah, and one of the phenomenons is that why rhythm is playing, the reason why we can move in and out of rhythm as a musician and do all kinds of funky dance steps and stay on the beat is because your brain actually is in train and kind of the minute it picks up on the rhythm, it's actually like a metronome, it's playing in your brain. Okay. So the rhythm is actually always there. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, 
where do you stand? I, I don't know if you follow the controversies like in the Daimi Church in the US that some people like to sing the, the songs, the Daimi hymns in English and other likes to sing it in Portuguese and consider like a perversion to translate. Where do you stand on that controversy? I am so glad you asked that. And I got to tell you, honestly, I had a little section there about the talk and you know, you have to start editing to get things down, right? And I remember thinking like, I hope somebody asked me this question. Right, and here's why. There, there's a lot of misconceptions and romantic, particularly from the young white men that go to the Amazon and they come back three weeks later and, you know, I studied with a shaman and I know now I'm a healer. I'm going to lead ceremony. And in that realm of thought, and this happens in the Santo Daime Church a lot, there's this idea like, oh, for it to be true and authentic, it really needs to be in Portuguese in the context of the Daime, right? Or it's like, oh, no, it needs to be Shipibo. Right. I'm just here to tell you officially, worldwide, watching this video, that's bullshit, right? And here's why. We were studying with a 70-year-old maestra on my last dieta, which is when you kind of, for a period of time, study with a particular plant, usually in concert with ayahuasca. And we're working with a plant called Nuyarao. And right before one of the ceremonies, one of the uh, participants, the pasajeros, passengers, they call them, said, oh, is it okay if I sing along? And the person that was kind of orchestrating said, oh, well, yeah, but it has to be in Shipibo and it needs to be in the same style. And I got translated to Manuela, Manuel, her name, and she said, no, 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 no. She said, I'm singing to you in my native language because that's all I know. She said, if I could sing to you these prayers in English, I would, right? Because you can definitely get the intention, the cadence, again, the frequency and vibration, and possibly the intention from the song. But if someone's singing to you in your native language and says to you something like, you know, the lyric might be, a, dear me, I forgive you. All of a sudden it's like, yes, I had to forgive myself. That's not going to happen if she's singing it in Shipibo, right? Same thing happens with the daimi and these hymns. Some of them just don't translate well into English. They just don't land, right? Um, the, the, the same problem we have with translating any kind of poetry. Um, so, yeah, they're better off sung in the native language, but a lot of them translate beautifully into English. And since the daimi itself says that the entire doctrine, all the teachings are in the hymns, then you want to sing them and hear them in English, at least the ones that work, basically. You know, and I actually met uh, Clancy, uh, we met in the daimi, you know, and it was back then, as you recall, that was always one of the controversies with the churches. It's like, we got to sing in Portuguese. No, I want to hear it in English. Ideally, both work, and for the reasons that I just brought up. Some of the most profound experiences I've ever had in ceremony, it was when a particular lyric landed at the right time, which felt like it was exactly what I was going through and what I needed to hear. And it would have been missed had it been in Portuguese or any other language. So that's my feeling. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. That's it. Love you guys so much. Can't wait for the rest. Thank you. Thank you.